you were doing here? Well, the only obstacle I have here is that you're in the way. Oh, wait a minute. We're too far away. You're too far away. Yeah. I want to get a nice, nice shot of this entrance. I, I like being in the field, as you know, and, and I like uh, doing post-production. Right, Let's we'll see, we got a oh, white balance on that guy's shirt. And we got a 5,000. Went down. Good, we did it. Okay, here we go. And when you're both a cameraman and an editor, uh, you're, you automatically become a producer, and that's why my title's pretty good for me, uh, associate producer. It makes a lot of sense. So technically, I'm a field producer cameraman, and coupled with that, I'm a production supervisor, post-production supervisor and editor. So I basically have four jobs, but they happen to call me associate producer. And it works out very well. And, and uh, I, I love shooting, I love editing, and a magic happens when you do both, as you know because you've done the same thing. What's, what's the main issue here for the main issue is the shadows, harsh shadows versus bright well, What do you light. do with the shadows? What do, how do you uh, deal you with You try them? and shoot in a direction where the light's hitting. You know, it doesn't pay to shoot that way. If you turn that way, you'll see the sun, and all you see is dark shadows. No good. People don't want to see that. They want to see good, well-lit subjects with color temperature. And I'm looking around to see if I see any tight shots that are nice. Actually, that beach is kind of nice. But nice steady shots, dude. DSO what are some of the things you're discovering while you're shooting them in terms of what to focus on and uh, what kind well, of landscape? Well, focusing's easy. You zoom in, pull back. But you want to you want to shoot, you know, a nice, nice aesthetic shot, beauty shot. And right now I'm shooting palm trees. Uh, palm trees. How would you do? You check in for white balance here in a situation like this? Well, you keep white balance on the white ships. They're actually going down to 53. We have to keep updating white balance because what happens is color temperature changes, pretty soon we're going to run into golden time, which photographers like, which is an indoor color temperature of the sun, somewhere around 3,000 or 3,000 K. What about your iris settings and all that on this? Well, you have to be very careful with the iris, make sure it's exactly, you know, so you don't get what we call blooming, where the color keys out of whatever you're shooting. Put the camera on the tripod. How do you slide it on the tripod properly? Make sure it clicks. And I heard a little click, not much of it. Can we try that one more time to show sure. everyone how it works? Sure, you take this out. Let me just get over here with this light. Put the no v, light. v mount right in there. Wait one sec. So the V mount is what? That thing. Uh, well, this is a plate that has a V at the, at the front. You push it in, and then there's a, a bolt back here that locks to the end of the camera to secure both the front and back of the camera. And then if you hear that click, right there, and then you pull back to make sure it did click. Can you show what was, uh, where you, you put that? Show us that. Uh, sure, we just plugged the, the uh, XLR really connector into the left rear input, which is also XLR. I always get confused about which is male and female. I like to think that, that these are male and those are female. And you put the male into the female, and here you uh, have to hook up your headphones. And on this camera, it's very unique. Um, it's the second output, not the first one. So it's kind of over here. And very dark. And uh, now we have to turn the camera on and see if we're hearing anything. I'm hearing bars, so now we take it off of bars. And now I can hear a camera. All right, so now I also want to move the camera back so it's balanced. And you do that by you know, calculating and seeing it seems balanced. And then put a little forward, or actually maybe a little back, because you're going to be tilted down when you're shooting. And you want to make sure it's balanced so you don't lose control of it. Now the other thing we want to do is we want to do what we did yesterday, widen the base. The one with the white hair. Yeah. Of the yeah. tripod. 
And why is that? So the camera won't rock forward. You want to lower the center of gravity of the drive by. Otherwise, the camera could rock forward as I'm shooting. I mean, I'll save it, but uh, this is less likely to fall forward or move. So the Astra actually did have that rock. Okay. Basically, now, just for safety, I'm putting on preset. Putting on Where is the preset? One. Preset's, preset's actually right here, that P right there. Now I also have to make sure, this is very important, now that I've got the uh, balance done, I've got to set the bubble. The bubble's way off. So you want to get a shot of that bubble here. There you go. Where is that? There's a bubble right, right in there. That's right, that's right. Well, it won't focus, so back up a little. And there it is right there in center. It's just like a level that a carpenter uses. And that's an easy way of us telling whether the bubble is in the center or not, whether the camera's level. Now, let's see if we can get a line feed. So here's the true test. What did you just do? I just knocked line. it down a line level. Now it's on mic level, not hearing anything. And I'm hearing something on camera, so I know my phone's work. On mic level, it's not working, and on line level. Now yesterday, they, I heard it on mic level, but then they switched it over to line level, because the mic level started to distort. Because the impedance was uh, off. So now, let's see. Oh, now notice how the camera's going backwards. That means we've got to pay a little attention to the uh, centering of the camera front back. So, okay, so I lock. When you, ever you leave the camera, um, it's a good idea to take the camera off the tripod, but we're not going to do that. Um, so we're locking it so it doesn't tilt forward and fall, especially when we have people in front of it. it backwards. Okay, so I'll put her on channel one. He's coming out. And that's on the on the left there like that? Or? Yep. And, and the one on the right is channel two, right? Yeah. We're going to do. Mm -hmm. This one. When you shoot, when you when you when you set up camera and there's one thing missing like audio your line feed isn't there or whatever, and then your secondary audio is there. What happens? What is not there? Well, if, there is, if, the, if the line feed doesn't work, it's very disappointing, and it's out of my control. The backup is you always use camera mic, uh, but it's a little echoey. That's yeah. a problem. Yeah. Now, to explain to us what the line feed the really line is. The line feed is actually a direct feed from the audio Hi, mixer of uh, hopefully perfectly mixed sound perfect. coming from the band. And it just... Uh, it eliminates all the room noise and the echoes that you would pick up on the camera mic. So now I've got to set up the line feed. Personally, as a cameraman, I don't, I don't like to go down there and uh, shine a light in people's faces. I think it's annoying. So I'll put the gain all the way up to 18 dBs, uh, and occasionally, sometimes, if I feel like, if I, if I feel you know, in my gut that it's really not going to bother people. I put the light on a little with the 18 dB or 9 dB gain. So my, I even, you know, shot some audience today. I didn't go down because there was a big gap, you know, where empty seats, so it probably wouldn't look that great. But we got some good stuff earlier in the week. To how, shoot many hours, each up. how many hours did you shoot in the cruise versus how much is actually going to be used finally? What's that ratio? Uh, somewhere around seven, seven and a half, eight hours. Of footage. Yeah, and first. so she's going to end up using uh, 14 minutes once she edits it. How does that fit in terms of ratio compared to other ratios on other projects? Do you think it's necessary? For well, I, I really conserved. I mean, other trips, uh, other crews have shot more. You know, I've shot like 18 to 20, and she gets really upset. You know, people don't like to go through reams and reams of footage. But she does. She like well. She doesn't like. It. But no, she wants I mean, she does her research, and and but she's under so much pressure. She it's like her interviews. She tries to get people to talk in uh, straight sound bites yeah. that she doesn't have to cut up and butt splice and cover with B roll. Focusing right, and you optimize focus by zooming in as tightly as you can, focus on the object, and pull back. And then everything's in focus between where you focus and where we pull back to. It's called uh, Optimum Depth of Field. Can you turn it while I put the... Um, 
you You'd find her up there to see how so the viewer can so see. So I used to teach cameramen, if in doubt, left it out, turn it to the left. If you're shooting infinity, if you're shooting somebody close up, turn to the right, and everything else is in between. Approximate the best you can. All right, it's going to do a white balance on that drum. This preset's not going to do it. Wireless. Oh, white. One, two, two. White. White. Which one? Two, 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 two. What, what is your? What would you say? You're balancing. It's not white balancing, and that's important. Yeah, it's not white balancing. Why is the hot temperature too low? Temperature's too low. Yeah. One, two. One, two. I need a little more of this mic, so. Shoot at 3200 K, which is preset. Whatever the audience sees, the uh, TV audience is going to see. <coughs> That's the best I can do. What's the biggest mistake a cameraman could ever make in general? Is there, and then the next biggest. What's let, the let reporters and anchor people push them around. That's one of the mistakes I'm, I'm almost about to make. Now, the show's just finished, and you know we have to coil up cables and break down. But in order to do that, the first rule is take the camera off the tripod, okay? Put it on the floor. Why is that? Because it can't fall from the floor. It can always fall from the tripod. Sometimes the legs give out. Sometimes uh, people knock the tripods over. One time I was outdoors and a truck drove by and the wind sucked the tripod and made it fall down a hill and, and it broke. So, uh, the, I mean the camera broke. So we don't want to uh, do that. But anyhow, now, we also want to coil up this cable. Now you got to work out the kinks. So you kind of throw it down the stairs. After all the audience is gone, you don't want to hit anybody with one of those XLR connectors that could be a weapon. And so, the kinks are basically out, okay, and you make a loop about that big, and you go either side, back and forth like that, and, and when you feel the kink, make it have a tendency to go a certain way, and you throw the cable out again, and you go over-under like that, over-under, over-under. I used to actually do this for the guiding light, I was a professional... Uh, cable coiler, or what they call a utility technician, so that's where I learned that. And then you put the XLR into itself, and lo and behold, you have a nice, neat XLR cable coiled up. And we take that back. Now this XLR cable is coming out of the uh, audio mixer. We're going to leave here, so we don't have to crawl over people. We'll put it back in the next day. Unnecessarily, and nobody's going to seal the cable, and if they do, who cares? We've got plenty more. So... Put this down. Now we have to break the tripod. Now here's the number one rule of breaking the tripod. Then you put it in an area where you have plenty of space. Okay, and you unlock the brakes like so on all three legs and push it down. Now you'll notice this is a very wide base, but it's too wide really to fold up the tripod properly. So we loosen up these brakes right here and we collapse them, and then we tighten them again, and then we turn the tripod upside down. Oh, first we have to put these brakes on, sorry about that. When we turn the tripod upside down, connect it together, and now we actually have a little loop here, which is a tie which holds it conveniently together, so when you're carrying it and uh, walking around in public, it doesn't open up on you. That can be pretty embarrassing. I think it's embarrassing is a tripod that opens up in your public. People think, oh my god, you can't even do that. How's he going to shoot a camera? All right, and then just hold it like that and let it hang. A lot of people like to curl it and carry it like that. No, that's kind of difficult to do. Just let it hang. Just carry it with your fingers like that. Nice and easy. There you go. See? See? Very easy. And that's it. Then we're pretty much ready to go. Are there any last, uh, what we call, dummy checks or things you do when you leave a location like this? Yes. Even yes. if you think you're coming back or yes. something. Even what are some of those final things? you think you remember things? everything, you always do a dummy check because you, you may have forgotten something on the floor or a cable or maybe uh, a light lying around. You see a light lighting lying over there. I actually took it off the camera because I wanted to balance the camera a little more efficiently. And I also wanted to use the light to uh, check my uh, bubble. And the bubble's very important for making sure that when you shoot, uh, your camera is level. And uh, you can use the light to look at that. 
Um, some tripods, actually, if you have a battery, you can push a little button and the bubble lights up on its own. And then you have the uh, headphones, and these are brand new headphones, so we're trying to take care of these as well as possible. And then um, I've got a uh, somewhat of a utility belt here designed for video. And why would you, why is a belt necessary when you've got bags and, and you're perfectly capable because of carrying? Because you don't like to have to carry a lot of extra things, so you have a belt here which carries an extra backup battery. Again, backup is essential. And that can back up either the battery on the camera or the battery on the light. So now you have double backup in a sense. Very efficient. What are some of the hardships of being on a cruise gig like this in terms of shooting and what's, uh, you know, working with talent that doesn't understand technical and, tell, and thinks they know and tell you what to do and you can't do it. That, if you shoot down there, you'll see that that drum is so yellow that the camera will not wipe down the drum code temperature that low. And therefore, you have to shoot a preset, which means the video is going to look good, which is fine with me, but it's not fine with our talent. They want some white balance for every color that goes up there, which is virtually very difficult. So what would be the, the only remedy for that? It feels seems like an impossible Just, just shoot a preset, and if you point the camera down there, you'll see these. this color temperature here is closer to the daylight color temperature on that woman standing there. And, and down there is a very, it's called color temperature orange color temperature, which is almost a full color temperature orange, as opposed to a half color temperature orange, which is really what you want. Full color temperature orange is too much. Way too low. And I would estimate if we could get white balance on that, it would be a thousand degrees Kelvin. How do you deal with the audio in a situation where you have a lot of loud audio about 20 feet away? Well, these mics are very directional, so you got to point them at the mouth, but if you do, you're fine. These are designed for interviewing people in the loud city. Let's go to the interviews. We shot the interviews. How would you phrase the questions as a videographer, producer, interviewer? How would it, you? It, have it depends. I, it, I'd have to. I'd have to know specifically what we're talking about. But I. The, the point is, I would um, use my skills as an interviewer, and you have even better skills than myself, to um, draw it out. Right. How? Uh, by, by asking questions so I get the right answer. So how would you phrase it? I mean, you've been doing this for a long, long time when you have to cover for George Whipple or whatever when he's not there and you've got to get some answers. You've got to know something and you've got to dig for information when necessary. Well, it's very difficult when you're doing the red carpets because you're doing so many things. You're fighting for position. Um, you know, if sometimes you have a reporter that might help you, but sometimes you get a, a, a wall you know, like an abstract wall where you don't think they will, and you don't even, you have too much pride to even ask. Um, so then you ask for a PR person, or at least you get hold of, a, of some kind of press release, so you have a foothold, a small toehold on what's going on. Then you ask the keys to ask the first question. And then after that, as you know better than anybody, it's like a conversation. You pick up on what they say. You use the information, that first answer, and make a conversation. And that's Warholian, and that's the way you do the best interviews. And then focusing and action. Just a moment. Your names and where you're from the right I'm a Gene Wozniak. Gene Wozniak. Spell your last name. W-O-Z-N-I-C-K-I. And Joanne. Joanne, where are you from? New Jersey. New Jersey. So tell me what you think of the cruise. Oh, we love it. This is our fifth one. So, uh, <laughs> are you Irish? Uh, <laughs> she's the Irish. She's Irish, but I was raised Irish. Okay, so you can tell me that that yeah. you're not you're not Irish, but you were raised Irish, and your wife's Irish, Irish. and yeah. you're Irish. Okay. I, I was raised Irish, and uh, my wife is Irish. So that makes us, uh, Don't look at the camera, and then just after that, just so we've been having a great time. Okay. And we've been having just a wonderful time. We love the music, we love the dancing, and uh, it's just a great place to be. Are you enjoying this? Oh, the entertainment is great this year. We're really having a good time. When you're shooting the interviews, not setup interviews, but the short interviews that you were shooting, you shot over Trisha's right shoulder. Mm -hmm. Correct. Well, is that your choice or her choice? Is that all? You always go over no, right shoulder. No, because the next one we try and shoot over the left shoulder. You want to get people looking different ways. You don't want everybody looking the same way. Right. 
So I, I don't. It doesn't matter which shoulder. The 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 problem's the background. What what's gonna? What, I want them looking into a nice, looking across a nice background. And does how does Trish work with it? Do you have to push move Trish further away sometimes to achieve? I got to sometimes move her closer so that when I get, get an occasional two shot because she likes the B roll shot mm -hmm. of where she she may be talking a little though you don't see her mouth, mm -hmm. and then the other one's listening. So she, she could use that as an introductory shot because we didn't have any time for me to shoot two shots or B roll or what we call noddies where she's nodding her head while reverse position. The key to really good production and good editing is is uh, really um, uh, skillful use of nap breaks. Hmm. Because what does a nap break do, in your opinion? We know that a, a nap break is a natural sound break. It's it's uh, it, it it does a couple of things. First, uh, creates a break in the action, mm -hmm. so that you don't lose the viewer's attention. They get to catch up with some of the information, and then you're kind of demonstrating both in terms of video and audio, what was just mentioned in, in the Channel 1 narration track or soundbite. And, uh, and it just makes for better television. Television is a visual medium. medium. It's also an auditory medium, so you want to see and hear uh, what the um, writer or the uh, person being interviewed uh, just uh, uh, expressed or talked about. How do you find that natural sound break when you're at an event and you just don't know what? It's what's the most work? important thing. It's it's when when you're producing, um, and you're creating your skeleton. You, I'll, I'll choose like two or three nap breaks um, after I put the skeleton together, and you've gone through that process with me. And it's the hardest thing and the most important thing to see what's going to fit. Um, in terms of the context of the writing, so we will put sound bites, and then you go back and put uh, two or three nap breaks. But but um, the nap breaks have have some prerequisites. Uh, they can't be long because we have two lim minute limit two minute limitation on the packages, um, and they um, uh, have to have some kind of emotional content or maybe even uh, some kind of explosive impact, depending on the type of movie you're covering. And, uh, and, and, and the quick gnats are the ones that really are effective. What's a quick nap break? A quick nap break might be a very quick explosion. <laughs> Like recently, we were doing Whiplash. I don't think you've seen that, but it's a it's a movie uh, with J.K. Simmons, who plays this uh, very overpowering and, and maybe even uh, abusive uh, orchestra director and music teacher, who is trying to uh, whip this drummer into shape. And at one point, he he you feel the tension build up, and and you see it in the trailer where he literally throws a drumstick at him. The kid ducks and. And uh, it, it's a very intense scene, but it's quick. And that, that was the perfect nap break. Um, because during the back time, you can see the tension build up. And, 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 and you know, the track might be something like J.K. Simmons uh, plays the part of the dramatic teacher. And then, bam, all of a sudden he throws the... He, I think the, the line was, um, uh, was that, what, what, was your pace too quick or too slow? He goes, oh, I don't know, and then he throws the thing at him. So it's quick and, and it's comprehensive. That's a good word for nap break. Something that's comprehensive where you see uh, kind of like a quick, complete scene.
cut in half by the shade. It just doesn't look good. Aesthetically, uh, technically, it's very hard to deal with. What do you iris for, the shade or the sun? So the answer is consistent lighting. You get them all out in the sun, which we did. We had to do it before the sun went down, because now there's more shade there, as you can see. Point the camera over here. Now, before the line was here, so it just barely made it okay. And then, of course, you go in here, and up here you've got got totally in the shade, so that's why we're lighting with the HMI light. We could have even used the second HMI light, and that would have made, made a difference. Uh, but it, it, it was fine, you know, so you iris up a little, but you don't or open iris a little, but good, the good news is you don't have to open iris so far that the background's totally washed out. So that's the goal, intelligent, even lighting. It's just harder to do outside. What's the primary style when you're doing that, the secondary and then the, try the, the third rate style? Well, Trish wanted me to start, you know, get, get, get a good wide shot. So not only did I do that, I got, like, uh, I think I got two incredible high shots from the uh, next level, the uh, 12th floor. And uh, that worked out great, especially as you saw, going right down on the dancer then tilting up to uh, Stephen's green. It's fantastic. And they're great guys. They didn't mind the fact that we were like trying to light their faces. They have sunglasses. That's good. Our light's very bright. You know, it's kind of tough for uh, the talent to take some time. But since the, the sunlight is so bright, their irises and their uh, eyes actually uh, close up, so it's not so bad. If we were to take somebody in a dark room and hit them with a 650 watt light, that would blind them. That would be really bad because the irises are open. And bang, you hit it. So basically, you, what you do is if you're if you're shooting somebody indoors, you fade that light up slowly and let their irises shut down slowly so they don't get like a big, you know, watch in their eye when they're being interviewed. Um, a lot of people may make mistakes when they first start editing and putting a scene of dialogue in. That's kind of long. Uh, that's not a good nap break. It's got to have more emotional content or, you know, a, a stroke and then a, a counter stroke where somebody's yelling at them. And, uh, and then you bring the nap break down, and then you, you trail it. And then you, um, maybe underneath the next track, you see that, that person's reaction. But it's got to be quick. It, it's got to have pace. It's got to be a, a, a length that will add emotional content or some kind of impact and, and but maintain the pace of the package you give up work you give up wedding you give up time away from your family you come all the way down here for very little pay why Oh, well, first of all, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, having you here has is, is, uh, been a great experience, and, and, you know, we're good friends, and I, thought, I, thought, I think you feel the same way. This is a wonderful experience. Um, get to see the Screaming Orphans, who we're both in love with now. It's like everybody, you know, anytime I tell somebody I'm doing this, uh, you know, I'll say tough duty, and they laugh, you know. How would you take all the skills you have with, a, with 8, 9, 12, 20000 $20,000 cameras? And transition them. All the what? Transition all your the skills. skills. All the skills you've been talking about. And oh, all you the have to read. No, no, no. Yeah, you have. I had to how read. You... I not easy. I had to relearn how to shoot to complement the DSLR look. In other words, I had to stop zooming. I was a zoom freak. I used to start tight, pull back, because we always camera edited. So if you camera edit and you start tight, pull back. Guess what? You're not going to have a jump cut because you always start tight, pull back. Well, I had to break that habit. It took me years. And then I finally got it when my editor sat me down and I noticed that I'd hold for two and a half seconds and pull back. Two and a half seconds, pull back. And editors don't like that. They want a static shot for 15 seconds at least. So you have to relearn. Now, now that I've, uh, now, now I've kind of conquered a camera with complementing DSLR, so I'm a little step closer to learning DSLR should be a little easier for me, but I, I got to learn the, the technical aspects of the camera. I have to understand ISO. A lot to learn there. Um, and they, uh, they actually have their own version of white balance. Got to learn that. I have to learn histograms. They got that stuff. Um, it's totally different. So I got a lot to learn. What's the most important thing to have backups of when you're on the camera? The airship. 
right to keep, keep it right here. Something goes down. You're shooting at a Jewish wedding, a Jeep, a couple, the camera goes down, bang, you're back up in seven seconds. So it gives you a nice, it rarely happens, maybe once every five years. But it gives you a nice feeling of uh, comfort that you have a backup. What, what's the after that, next after that? Batteries. Batteries, you always have plenty of batteries. I just carry a backup battery right here. All right, that's a backup battery. And, uh, Does the backup back have to be as good as the uh, primary? It doesn't hurt. Excuse me. Yes or no, can you do it? I'll grab it. Just going straight back, thank you. Just had a little extra there. Well, why is the battery, why is the wire hooked under the seats like that? Uh, so people can trip over. I, I'm a guy that grew up shooting real cameras with real lenses. And this, for example, doesn't have a real lens. You know, it's all autofocus and all that stuff. And, and you've done nice work with it. I, I've seen it. Um, and that's great. But sometimes you need control. You need to do a rack focus. You can't do that with these cameras. Unless you pre-program it, touch this and that. But it takes too long. Right. Um, you know, DSLR cameras. They just... You can't shoot a, a, di a documentary of a day that's constantly moving with a DSLR camera. You don't have that time, unless you have at least three. You can't. You need at least three to do a wedding. In the case of this camera, this obsolete camera, both these switches have to go on to turn the power here and here. Which okay. switch is that? Can you show us that specifically? Yeah, that's right here and right here. And what power switch is that called? What's that called there? The one that first power switch on power off, switch and power switch on off, and standby so where you can save turn. power. Why, why two? Uh, because you have two components here. This is called a dockable deck. So dockable deck right here. So you almost have two cameras, you have two cameras, but you have two sections. Two sections of the camera. So that's yeah. first. It's not a unicam. After this, they came out with the unicam configuration. And the next step after that. So the next step after that is you um, want to. Uh, well, let me th let me think. Uh, um, if you're going handheld, put the camera on your shoulder, and you want to see the image, and basically set your focus. And, um, and also make make sure your back focus is good. When you say set the focus, could you give it a quick demonstration? Yeah, demonstration? if in doubt, left it out. If you're shooting something close up, you turn it more towards the right. When you say if in, it's if mid range, left. it's somewhere in between. If in doubt, left it out is to remind you that infinity is to the left. Right. Okay. So if I'm shooting something far away, like we were shooting on the boat today, I always go f far away, and that's and and that's your fine focus. But make sure the back focus is good by zooming all the way back, and you should see a clear picture. If if you think it's soft, then you need to get out a um, a, 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 a um, swirl chart and set the back focus. Very important because if you don't, anytime you zoom back, you get a soft image. And your fine focusing is going to be more difficult. You have shallow, shallower depth of field to work with. What's so, up? Uh, this what, right. Oh, by the way, this, our last this right here, this right here is your um, auto iris button. So you want to turn that on manual, so you can ride your iris manually. That lets the light into the lens. Can you display that auto iris button? Sure. That's right here. That's right here. Now you can use auto iris as a second opinion. But usually auto iris is right a little hot, so you really want to write it manually. And what should it be on? Auto? No, no, you, you, it's auto for a second opinion and manual for right, for actually writing the iris manually. Hmm. And you want to make sure your zebras are just a touch if you're doing an interview, for example. Uh, shoot my face. You just want to touch a touch of like zebra around the, the prominent features of the face, the chin, like my forehead juts out because I played football, the, 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 the nose, you know, and the tips of the ears, you just see a little bit of zebra there and your picture should be perfect. Could you describe what zebra is? Yeah, zebra is just like, you know, these uh, lines inside the viewfinder that give you a guideline as to how to ride your iris. Oh. It's, it's the hardest thing to learn. And camera work, by the way. So how do we? Um, what's now then you then you also have your zoom. You know, so you want to zoom in, zoom back, 
And uh, for the most part, these days, I'm using the zoom a lot less. So, you know, so any, uh, that, that's, zoom. Yeah, that's right here. Um, over on this side, and that's, you've what's... got, this is another important uh, uh, thing. But, well, first, when you do your white balance, this is preset, this is A and B. Okay, and e each time you change this filter, filter 2 is the cross filter with the crosshairs, filter 1 is for indoors, filter 3 is for clouds, filter 4 is for bright sun. Or this could be like a cloudy, partially sunny day. And you go through the filters time, one more time, filter yeah, 1. Yeah, each time you change your filter, 1, 2, 3, 4, right, you have to re-white balance here on A and B is your backup. Okay, this right here, auto trace, if you really get in a bind like I did today, hit hit auto trace white balance and let the camera try and white balance itself. Okay, if, I think it works. It's hard to tell because we have a black and white view. Okay, so you're setting your white balance. I hold the white sheet up to people. Right, Somebody and that, that what, switch what is you, right here. How you, do you push it up and that's white. Or then you pull it down and that's black and then push it up again, white. And that gives the best contrast ratio, contrast ratio, and noiseless picture possible. But what so happens? black mount is very important. You've got a white sheet up below somebody's chin. What happens when you push that down? What do you see in the viewfinder? And what? How do you know? It turns when it's to right? black. Now, in other words, you have this. That's a good point. This has to be an auto iris. Mm -hmm. And then when you go black, it turns to black. So it's white balancing on black. So you want it to white balance. The black. Sorry, it's black balance on black. So you want it black balance on black white balance on white, so you have to shoot the white sheet with the lens. And what happens when you're viewing the white sheet and you haven't set it yet? What do you see? Uh, basically, if, if, if you, as you're setting it, you'll see the white balance go into the right color temperature. And then you also see the indication of, of inside that says uh, AWB OK. What do you know? What, how do you know what the right color temperature is? What is that color temperature? Um, well, it, it, what, whatever the camera tells you, it, 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 as, long as, tell it you. A, as long as it says AWBOK, okay, you're good. Okay. And, that's and then, when it, you say, white then it says ABBOK, okay, then you do the AWBOK. Okay. So you twi white balance twice to black balance once. The Pro problem I'm having, and it's not, you know, so you white balance for what it is, but the light's white balancing at 3,900, 3, 4,000K around there, and usually it comes in at 3,600K. It should be 3,200K. So, the, so the, the gels are fading. So it's not really changing the normal light as much as it should. So I have to investigate that, maybe get some new gels. But key thing is white balance. Just white balance, white balance, white balance. Why is that? Can you work in the black balance in a situation like this or no? Well, you always get a black balance, but once I have the black balance, like, you know, I'll, I'll just, to speed things up, I'll just white balance, white balance. The first time I'll do a black balance. So white, black, white, then succeeding times, white, 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 white. It'll be fine. And then the, other, the only other thing I want to show you is this right here. This is gain. Low, medium, high, and in this camera, I am telling you, you, <laughs> I've been using gain this whole trip, especially with some of the indoor stuff. So that that explain uh, what the difference is in the gains and if, what well, the, the parallel is ISO with photography. You raise the ISO to to or try to, uh, tr electronically lighten the picture, okay, and that's and that's digital photography. Uh, here, it's it's called gain, and so you have basically. Uh, zero, uh, 9, and 18 decibels gain. It's measured in decibels. And that increases, it, it electronically lightens the picture, but at the same time, it also increases your noise in the picture. So, in other words, your signal to noise ratio becomes less, which is bad. Um, but you got to go with what you go with. Uh, just to just to let you know, you also have hyper gain, and that boosts your uh, um, noise level big time. It's like shooting through a screen, but you can almost see, like in the dead of night, you could shoot like mice running you know, out, away from a garbage can, like I had to do one time. And you can do that with any camera, not just the one this big. There, a lot of cameras have that feature. Yeah. Low light shot. I'm not. I don't. I don't know if this one does, but uh, yeah, yeah. Well, Sony shoots in low light quite well. Right. It doesn't mean it has hyper gain. Right. But right. it shoots in low low light. Right. Right. Yeah. So I back to the numbers again. You were because you go a little slower with the numbers. The one, two, three, four. When would you okay, use so one? Okay. So this is indoor, indoor light, and incandescent. That's one. And that's one. Two is I want, if I'm shooting indoor, I want to do an aesthetic thing where you have crosshairs on on spotted lights, which we don't use that often. Trish doesn't like it. This is for cloudy or not so bright days. That's three. And four is for bright sunlight, like we were shooting out on the beach. Or if you're shooting snow, 
you need that uh, you need to let less light into the lens so that's what that that's what the filter does it controls the amount of light going in the lens and the goal is to put your iris if you're putting on auto iris to keep your iris in the middle so you have a little margin for uh, adjustment on either side because if you and this is important let's say you go outdoors and you forget to switch the indoor filter to outdoor like from one to three right and you have it on one then all of a sudden you're you're um, you're uh, you're gonna have to keep your iris almost closed to uh, make a good picture and then if uh, then if you want to adjust it you're, you're running to the end of it you don't want that you want the iris to be somewhere in the middle and that's that's where it's a function of filter versus amount of light coming into the lens and that's it so the interviews, with the interviews, Robin, what was the issue here? Problem I'm having, and it's not, you know, it's the white balance for what it is, but the light's white balancing at 3,900, 3, 4,000K around there, and usually it comes in at 3,600K. It should be 3,200K. So, the, so the, the gels are fading. So it's not really changing the normal light as much as it should. So I have to investigate that and maybe get some new gels. But key thing is white balance. Just white balance, white balance, white balance. Why is that? Can you work in the black balance in a situation like this or no? Well, you always get a black balance, but once I have the black balance, like, you know, I'll, I'll just, to speed things up, I'll just white balance, white balance. The first time I'll do a black balance. So white, black, white, then succeeding times, white, 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 white. It'll be fine. They need to be a bit closer together. Yes. Okay. And look at me. Okay. First of all, give me your name. I spell Salter. No problem. So let's do our white balance, Robin. Okay. So it's not changing the same every time. Okay, we're good. Okay, so I'm going to just Whoa, what'd you do? Destroying the equipment? Oh yeah, he was fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. And, and hello, that's good. Stand by. Action. So the sun out here is very bright, and I have to make sure that I'm on filter four, 5600 neutral density. That's the highest filter, highest filtration of the light. And then I have to make sure I'm white balanced. So now I'm going in. I get a reading of 7,500, okay, and now I'm black balancing, and then I'm going to go and do a 7,500, probably a 7,500, okay, again. now I'm ready to go, now I'm going to do a nice pan. Now, how do you know you're ready to go? When you say ready to go, how do you know that you're ready to go? Don't you have to test that? Now, uh, I'm going to get a nice pan right, both boats, to the shore. Starting on the backwash of the boat, tight shot. Pulling back, and I'm incorporating as much of the exploring the seas as I can. And I'm going to make a pan left and show our boat with that beautiful blue sky in the background. Now, now I switch positions. Why are you panning from right to left? I want to incorporate the whole. The whole landscape. Why the whole landscape? Now, now I'm just doing a static shot up front. Because you want to show the viewer what's here. Unfortunately, we're only doing 4.3. We don't have widescreen. Now watch this. Nice Please. shot here of both ships. Absolutely steady because you're fighting the wind. The wind, as you can tell, is very steady. Just Pull back as 
steadily as I could, and I pan right just to show more landscape. Now I'm going to do one more pan to cover myself. And I can use all these shots. For this shots like this be used, Robin, in the video that you're working on now for the show? Well, I think she's going to mention the fact that we stopped off the Bahamas and whatever the name of this island is. I don't even know what I think. I think they were even saying that the cruise line owns the island. Why half a pen? On the approach. Because I'm not really interested in what's over here. It's boring. This is more scenic. You got the huts. You got the tower. And then we'll get another shot of this boat. We'll pull back from this boat as it comes out that channel. This will be a nice shot. Pull wide just on this right here. Okay, stand by. So I zoom in. I get the focus right. Make sure the iris is right. And... What do you say? The content is intense or specific or? That was the best shot yet. The, re the reason is it's almost like it's almost like a tracking shot. Remember, it, you can think of the boat as being like uh, you know uh, a moving camera cart on railroad tracks. Okay, and that's a nice that's a nice film type cinematic type move where. Um, you know, you know, I'll, I'll just pull back as we're, it's nice to have a combination of moves. That way I pull back as we track right and then I pan right and everything was perfectly smooth. It was the best shot so far. Just fantastic. And then, uh, now we just give people an idea where we are, do a quick pan. Now, while you're doing all this, has anything changed for your settings, your balance, your white balance, anything else? Is it all the same? No, it's all the same. Why is that? because the sun hasn't changed significantly in the sky. If it goes down lower, the color temperature sun, sun changes uh, from, uh, you know, 7,500, 50, depends on the camera, 5,600. Let's see what the white balance is here. I'm gonna try it right now. Uh, I'm getting 7,000, same thing, okay. essentially. But if the sun were to go down like around sunset, uh, just before sunset, you get what they call golden time, which actually can be below 3,000, which photographers love. It's like indoor light coming from the sun. Okay, now we get another shot here. Now, aren't you shooting something darker when you're shooting the inside of the ferry? Well, remember, it's not just the inside. I'm, I'm shooting the whole thing. It's a wide shot. Uh, but I did find myself naturally irising a little, and then I closed iris about an f-stop going to where the sun was. So 
That's a good question. Wow, look at this. Here we are. We're back on, back from the boat, back on the ship. We're setting up for... We're just going to get a shot. Unfortunately, it's through. We have to move some furniture because I get get the right angle. Here we go. I don't want to shoot through a tinted window. It's going to change the color temperature. So how are you going to deal with this? And moving furniture, relocating the tripod. Now we've got a glass to shoot through. It's kind of a cool place to shoot from. Why would you come up to this to this level in particular? Well, it's nice to get elevation. A rare point of view. What's you know, the first change you're going to look I'm for gonna, in your setting? I'm going to select a filter that's going to work, which would not be filter four, so we're going to go filter three. Boop. And then we're going to white balance on something out there, preferably something with some light on it, and make sure the gain's on low. Make sure I don't see any stuff there. Okay, wow, this is actually kind of bright. Uh, maybe I will go filter for it, take that back. Let's see. If you put on auto iris, How do and you do it ends that? up somebody, eh, eh, yeah, I'll go with four. With that. I could go either way, actually. There we go. Right in there. So you want to go, and what is that setting you're setting? What is that called? This is the, uh, which, oh, this is filter right here. And that's the filter wheel. Now, there are two types of filters. There's the filter you put on the light and the filter that you set in the camera. So we're going straight down. Now, so I kind of jerked it. I kind of jerked the camera a little on the on the way down. So now I'm just going to go back up, and I wait five seconds. A steady shot, and then tilt up for a count of five, and hold for five. Now I'm shooting underneath the uh, jacuzzi cover there. And uh, I had to change filters because it's all shade, so I changed the filter three. Got a white balance of nine thousand, as opposed to filter four with seven thousand in the sun. What so made the difference ultimately? What color and what figure made the difference in the shot? Well, the the, the key the key question is why did I decide to do that? I, I wasn't getting enough iris open. I wasn't able to open my iris up enough on filter four. So I decided to switch to filter three, and then I realized, uh oh, I got a white balance for the shade anyhow, because it's total shade down there. You can shoot shade with a, a with a reading of like 7,000 or 5,600, but if you're going to do that, you also have to have actual sunlight incorporated into it. Then the human eye will accept it. It won't accept it if you're white balance wrong. If you're white balance for the sun, shoot the sh shade. The human eye will not accept that. All right, now I'm going to go back to four. Boy, the sun's going down. Wow. All right, well, now I'm going to rewipe down. We'll try three. I want to shoot that bar over there. Which bar? The, uh, the upper bar on the well, top? Well, yeah, I can't see the lower bar, unfortunately. Well, I've shot that. So we're looking at this bar right here, right? Yeah. yeah and what right. kind of a shot are you going to go? How close up are you yeah, going to go? That's a good question. I think what we need to do is kind of zoom in on it. So I'm going to start wide. Why would you start wide and zoom in versus zoom in and pull out? Go either way. I just hmm? feel like this is better. Why? Well, I can do both actually, like Trish choose. And really, it's six and one half dozen the other. A lot of people like cushions better. And they aesthetically do, they do seem to be very nice, the cushions. I'm all white balance with 9500 filter 3. Okay, now, now I'm doing a. Oh shoot! Let, let me move her. Okay. I'm gonna get a two shot of the jacuzzi, and then I'll get a tight shot. What's a two shot? Describe a two shot. Any, any, any item that you're shooting, and you're shooting two of them. It's two shots. So I'm shooting two, incorporating two jacuzzis in the shot. Uh -huh. So you're moving the camera to both, or you're nope. including both in one shot? No, no, no movement. So you're making the frame big enough to include oh. both jacuzzi. So it looks something like... Now it doesn't hurt to do 
try a very wide shot just to establish the scene. Actually, it's kind of nice. Geometrically, it looks very nice. You'll see what I mean when you log this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. Now I'm going to shoot these girls in the shade. Where? In the jacuzzi. Now what's the difference when you shoot the girls in the shade? Where? I have to make sure I'm white balance correct. Oh, the sun just came up. Now I'm going to re-white balance. You, gotta, you always have to be aware of the sun. Now that's eight, that went down from 95 to 8,000. It's even better. It's a great shot. Shoot. Oh, there's a nice shot of this woman taking a picture. I kind of like that. Let's get another white balance on that. This should be around the same. Oh, 75. Ah, uh, she's, she's finished, unfortunately. But we have other things in the, the shot. It's a huge shot of a lot of content. Well, here we go. We've got some people walking down the side. We'll get that. It's nice. They may even be part of the Irish group. So On the upper better. deck. Oh, okay. So the movie one with the camera, then. Nice shot, right? Yeah, it is nice. Okay, it's got... always important to set your shot up before you start recording. Because people don't want to see you focusing and moving your camera around. It's a waste of time. They're not, you're not going to use it. Now that flag happens to be stuck now, the flag that I need. So we need a strong wind to unfold. This one over here on the left. And we're waiting for the uh, flags to blow. Sometimes it's a waiting game, and here they go. And now we have a shot. Perfectly frame, focus, and white balance. And we hold for seven more seconds. So when you're scanning your sector like this, what kinds of shots are you looking for? Looking in terms for whatever attracts my eye, which hopefully will be the same as what attracts the viewer's eye. Mm -hmm. And what kinds of shots would attract, in your opinion, when you're looking at such a broad anything that's base? Anything aesthetically nice looking, uh, anything that informs our story.